Okay, welcome to this uh, roundtable uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Journal of Peace Research. My name is uh, Edith Gudal and I'm the editor of JPR. We have one change uh, to the panel. Uh, Amelia Hefner Burton wasn't able to make it to the conference uh, and she's replaced by Isaac Svensson, who's also an author uh, in the uh, anniversary special issue of JPR. And JPR, as uh, many of you know, was established in 1964 by Prio founder and first director Johan Galtung, and later edited for 28 years, uh, no less, by uh, past ISA president and uh, longtime Prio researcher, uh, Nils Pedigledic. Thematically, uh, JPR is broadly oriented. The journal is explicitly multidisciplinary and committed to uh, methodological pluralism. We're particularly interested in publishing cutting-edge empirical research. While the journal, journal is a leader in uh, quantitative analysis of peace and conflict, including uh, through the publishing of dataset articles and requesting authors to post their replication data online, we also very much uh, welcome good qualitative empirical articles, uh, theory, and review pieces. Uh, JPR has, over the past decade or so, uh, been uh, highly ranked on the citation indexes. We currently uh, are ranked sixth, both on the political science and IR uh, journalists of uh, the Web of Science, which we take great pride in. We're also uh, listed second on the Google uh, Scholar uh, Diplomacy and International Relations list. And we receive a little over 400 uh, submissions a year and publish roughly 50 articles. JPR is also a green open access uh, journal, which means that the LO, um authors post the final post-review version of their manuscript on their own uh, web page. And we have a true global both authorship and uh, of, uh, audience. Many of the scholarly debates that have been central to the JPR and uh, the broader field of peace and conflict research are summarized in a number of review or overview articles published in the uh, issue 2 of 2014, the anniversary special issue. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have uh, several of the authors uh, of uh, special issue articles and one of the guest editors, Jack Reedy, here today to speak about the uh, special issue. Uh, the uh, issue came just uh, off the press now in March uh, and is also available online for free for the next uh, four weeks at least. Uh, we also have a few hard copies here today uh, and Sage uh, have more copies uh, at their booth. Um, we also have two eminent scholars uh, serving as uh, discussants, Jack Olson and uh, Scott Gates. Um, we have uh, the, uh, the contributors to the special issue who will be uh, speaking are Gerald Schneider uh, on globalization, Monica Duffy Toft on territory, uh, Vali Kubi on natural resources, and Isaac Swenson on uh, international mediation. But first, uh, let me turn to Jack Levy, who was the co-editor, along with Halvard Buhag, uh, of the anniversary special issue. Jack is Board of Governors Professor of Political Science at Rutgers University and affiliate at the Salzman Institute of War Peace Studies at Columbia University. And he is also past ISA president. Um, so Jack, we're very pleased to have you here. <coughs> Thanks, uh, uh, Henrik. Uh, it was a Pleasure working with you and uh, Halvard on the on the special issue, and with the contributors who took their tasks uh, seriously, responded effectively to our comments, uh, did a great job of summarizing their respective uh, uh, literature in their respective areas, and they managed to do so under rather tight restrictions as to uh, length. Um, anyway, given what I think is the division of labor among the introducers, the paper givers, and the uh, uh, and the panels and discussions, I'll, I'll try to uh, give a very brief sense of, of some of the um, articles. The, the special issue begins with an article by Nils Petter uh, uh, Gladich and J Jonas uh, Nordkill and Harvard Strand on the, the status of uh, peace, both negative and, and positive, in the study of peace and conflict research over the last 50 years. It's a very nice conceptual uh, and quantitative description of the, the evolution of the field. Uh, special issue then turns to what is certainly one of the most widely sustained and productive research programs in, in IR during the second half of JPR's first 50 years, that is the, the democratic peace, and more recently the, uh, you know, the broader liberal peace, um, 
Robert Higley uh, tackles the, the democratic piece uh, at the monadic, dyadic, and systemic levels, both uh, between states and within states, and tries to integrate the theoretical arguments and does that very nicely. He also examines the um, alternative hypotheses that uh, peace creates the conditions under which democracy can flourish, um, and uh, the argument that the relationship is spurious and what we really have uh, is a capitalist peace or perhaps a territorial uh, peace. I'll leave it to uh, Gerald uh, Snyder to talk about uh, his article about the two important variations of the economic piece and to uh, Monica Toff to talk about uh, territory and, and war. The next two uh, articles examine ethnicity and ideology in, in civil wars, um, noting that civil wars are more likely to be in, initiated by ethnic groups than any other group. Uh, Elaine Denny and Barbara Walter argue that ethnic groups um, generally had more grievances uh, against the state because leaders um, of heterogeneous societies often favor their own groups. Um, um, ethnic groups also have an easier time mobilizing support because of their uh, identity and geographic concentration and more difficulty bar uh, resolving bargaining problems because of the relatively inelastic uh, nature of ethnic uh, identity. Um, in their uh, analysis of ideology, Francisco Gutierrez Sanin and Elizabeth Wood argue that uh, ideology matters for civil war in uh, a couple different ways, uh, both instrumentally and normatively. Instrumentally, ideology helps socialize um, uh, combatants with heterogeneous uh, motivations into a co coherent group to pr prioritize competing goals, reduce principal agent problems, and help uh, coordinate uh, external actors. Normatively, ideology provides the motivation and constraints that uh, help explain some non-interest-driven uh, uh, behavior. Um, next article is on natural resources, and I'll leave it to uh, Valerie uh, Kuby to, to talk about that. <clears throat> next article by Ron Smith looks at the economic impact of military conflict, um, giving particular interest in, <coughs> um, attention to methodological problems confronting any quantitative assessment of uh, economic costs of, of conflict including data limitations, um, and also uh, uh, in particular attention to some of the, uh, how the different dimensions of, of cost can be aggregated and uh, evaluated. Uh, <clears throat> um, Todd Sandler uh, assesses the analytical study of uh, uh, terrorism, uh, looking at trends in terrorist attacks, economic consequences of terrorism, effectiveness of counterterrorism, causes of terrorism and relationship between terrorism and liberal democracy. Um, Emily Hathaway Burton looks at the social science literature on human rights. Um, she emphasizes, uh, uh, she looks at the conditions most conducive to, to human rights, including um, conflict and weak or, or overly powerful state institutions. And she also looks a little bit about um, what can be done to uh, deter or re reduce uh, abusive practices, so she concedes that uh, we know much less about uh, that than the causes of those abuses to begin with. <clears throat> the next two articles um, focus on methodology and, and, and data, continuing a rather distinctive contribution of uh, JPR uh, since its founding. Uh, Philip Schroep uh, offers what he describes as a deliberately polemical critique of the ways in which uh, scholars use statistical methods. A few of his uh, seven deadly sins are the use of kitchen sink models that ignores effect of collinearity, uh, the, the dismissal of predictive power as a criterion for uh, assessing the validity of a model, um, the improper use and interpretation of frequent, uh, frequentist uh, uh, statistics and significant tense, set tests, and the advantages of Bayesian uh, approaches. And, and finally, he uh, points to the confusion between statistical controls and experimental controls. Uh, so that's a, a lively piece. Um, uh, another article on, on data, uh, uh, Christian Gladich, uh, uh Niels Metternich, and uh, Andrea Ruggeri emphasize the um, uh, interaction of sy systematic data collection and theory development. Um, uh, uh, and how that's the, the interaction has generated uh, uh, progress in, in peace and conflict research. Um, they give particular attention to the growing emphasis on different forms of disaggregation of, of data in, in conflict research um, and uh, consider some of the implications of big data for the analysis of, of peace and conflict. 
Um, the opportunities created by big, big data is also a theme in the, the Schneider uh, uh, article and the Toft article and maybe some others I can't remember. Um, and the special issue ends with an assessment of the literature on uh, mediation by Peter Wallenstein and uh, Isaac Svensson, and Isaac will talk about that uh, later. So it's, uh, it, I think it's a great issue, it's fun working on, and uh, I look forward to the 100th uh, special anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack, for coming up soon. Um, we'll move over to the uh, paper presentations. Uh, first is uh, Joel Schneider. Uh, his, uh, the title of his piece is Peace Through Globalization and, Capital uh, and Capitalism, Prospects of Two Liberal Propositions. I'm slightly jet lagged and spent the last night with my doctoral students in a chess board. I need structure and PowerPoint uh, will provide this kind of uh, structure, a short summary uh, of my article, but I would like them to also say something about my uh, career and how much this career evolves to uh, the Journal of Peace Research at first. I will say something very, very briefly about my criticism of commercial uh, liberalism, and here I have a quote from an uh, unknown colleague who sent me an email which was not meant for me commenting on a formal paper uh, of me by saying that this is a strange paper for someone who claims to believe in commercial liberalism, uh, and uh, I will qualify this, uh, why I believe that I believe in commercial liberalism, but why we should not be naive believers in uh, certain um, theoretical concepts. Then I say something about uh, data, and I also speak about what we presently experience, namely anti-globalization, what this has on the, uh, what sort of impact this has on the risk uh, of the conflict. First, these personal remarks. I'm very, very grateful, obviously, to my co-authors, but also to the Journal of Peace Research, and especially to its former editor, uh, Nils Peter Gledic, uh, who is a co-author uh, of mine also on this very project of globalization um, and, um, and peace. I mean, we got to know each other in 1995 in a conference in Paris, and uh, we were just very desperate because we didn't find any other people who had similar mind frames uh, like us. Uh, due to Nils Petter's effort, due to uh, Journal of Pre uh, Peace Research, the situation has changed tremendously. In the United States, then, there was already a strong uh, peace science conflict uh, research community, and in Europe it was uh, taking off. But it takes organization for this uh, to happen, um, and uh, General Peace Research was quite instrumental uh, for this. Nils Peter uh, was acting as a co editor for the uh, journal uh, on two occasions. This also helped me to learn the ropes of editing journals and currently editing. Uh, uh, to the journals. Um, so, Journal of Peace Research has transformed me and put, I would guess, not only me into a better uh, scientist, you know, professional scientist. Uh, I didn't become Scandinavian, uh, didn't make me a better person, so, uh, <laughs> but I uh, believe it made me a better and more professional uh, social scientist. So, thank you, Nils Peter, thank you, uh, people uh, at uh, Journal of Peace Research, for contributing. Um, to conflict research, especially in Europe, where it hasn't been that strong. Okay, I've said something about this qualification by this anonymous or not so anonymous uh, uh, colleague. Um, I have been rambling against the opportunity cost uh, argument uh, for a very long time. This opportunity cost argument is the typical backbone um, that we have for uh, commercial uh, liberalism. This argument is quite simple. Wars are too costly, so uh, states would not resort uh, to uh, this sort uh, of uh, political instrument. But through this, you simply assume the usage of this instrument away. And this is obviously, in my opinion, not a convincing theoretical strategy. Hmm? Because 
there are incentives under which even sometimes in times of growing uh, globalization when a state leaders use force and as scientists we have to explore these conditions and this leads then in my opinion, opinion necessarily to qualifications and I have worked here on one qualification together um, with um, the Margaret Osman where we looked at the transition to more globalization and how this affects the risk for conflict because such transitions they create uh, losers um, and uh, we have found some uh, empirical um, evidence uh, uh, for this. Um, I also discussed the literature on capitalist peace. Some uh, people who have contributed to this literature to take it uh, then as sometimes as something opposing uh, commercial liberalism. For me, it's just the opposite side of the coin, meaning internal liberalization uh, of countries and there. I'm not so clear uh, sometimes what the theoretical status uh, of these propositions are, where they are coming from, what we lack here are solid mi micro foundations, but obviously we also lack them uh, to a large extent for uh, the globalization and peace uh, literature. Let me say something uh, about uh, the, uh, data. What we are currently witnessing is uh, like some uh, recurrence of the behavioral revolution. A lot of the research is data-driven. This is very good, but at the same time, we do not make uh, uh, progress at the similar level on uh, the uh, theoretical side. And there's a slight criticism I want to advance here towards the, the special issue. There is no chapter included about how much theoretical progress we have made and what status of theory with a big T and the mean formal theory, game theory, um, the status here, for instance, the crisis bargaining uh, literature and so on, um, is something which in my opinion has contributed tremendously about the thinking, uh, about the conditions of war um, and uh, this is an active research agenda um, and and we need in the future a better match between theoretical advances and also uh, the big data uh, revolution. And here my point is quite clear. I do not believe that we will make uh, significant contributions by simply continuing on this empiricist road. We need also uh, sound uh, theoretical progress. And this, uh, uh, it's the, I think the time is right for that. And for this, sometimes we use them. So we do not use large data sets, but we can um, restrict ourselves to relatively small um, bonds. Let me say something a person who wants to qualify the commercial liberalism, but simultaneously we live in a times where uh, globalization is not the, the most important trend in some countries uh, due to the economic crisis and so on. The level of globalization goes back, and I believe this is very dangerous. And we did not devote sufficient attention to this and to the risk of conflict or political violence in general. There is quite some empirical evidence, not sound theorizing, about how economic conditions affect, for instance, the risk of genocide. Here is just a slide out of Barbara Hart's famous article on genocide, and you see here that trade openness or the lack thereof, uh, kind of, uh, say, uh, is quite strongly linked then to the risk um, of genocide. And we have to explore these conditions, also think about the empirical uh, implications of the Great Recession. There are now some empirical studies published recently in the Lancet coming out uh, how mortality rates and so on were affected by the Great Recession. Some people, like Klaus Off, uh, believe that austerity kills. I do not necessarily believe that this is the case, but this opens up an important research agenda which is linked to this uh, globalization literature to which I have contributed uh, through uh, the Journal of Peace Research over the last two decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gerald.
The next speaker is uh, Monica Davidhoft, uh, and her article is on territory and war. Monica is the professor of uh, government and uh, public, not, not the professor, but yes, a I professor am. of uh, <laughs> government and public policy at Oxford University's Blavatny School of Government, and she's also a Creo Global Fellow. for having me. So it was really fun to write this article. I've been working on territory and war. I hate to admit it for probably 20 years now. And uh, so my dissertation was on it. It was interesting to go back 15 years after I had done that research, done the canvassing of the literature, to see actually what has advanced both empirically, I think you're right, a lot empirically, but also theoretically. I would contest a little bit about there not being enough theory in the journal. Uh, since many of us sort of, you know, the empirical studies that we analyze, of course, have, some of them had a pretty heavy uh, theoretical basis. But then importantly, the methodological advances as uh, an article on territoriality, and I'm actually not going to talk about it here. We've got Nils and others in the room that are ex more expert than I am on this. It is sort of the geographic information systems and the coding of, of uh, different kinds of groups uh, below the state. So there's been some real advances. Uh, so here I'm just going to take you through some of the data. So what I did was just sort of assess the entire field. Every, I tried to isolate every article that's been written on territory and war, and then coded them. So if you're a graduate student here, uh, there's a really nice appendix that these guys made me reduce this article. I was probably the worst offender and tried to say, please, please, can I have 13,000 words? Um, but in any event, there's a pretty hefty bibliography and appendix associated with it tracking territoriality in all its beauty, from the origins, resolution, and um, conduct of war. So it's featured as a core aspect of war. I don't think this is surprising to any of us, but I do think we sometimes forget about it. Uh, we can think about Crimea today. Uh, I actually almost wrote my dissertation on Crimea, and I, I sort of regret it a little bit now, but maybe not. Um, but you know, the idea that territory is at the heart of these things, we think in the modern era, people are not going to be fighting over land, right, over borders. But it, it turns out that it's, it, it, it has been the case historically and into um, uh, the future and today, if you look at the conflict. Origins have been privileged. Uh, if you look at all the data sets, and the, the data sets that I would probably to place are, of course, cow and then mids. And then if you look at the Civil War, uh, it's much more of a mixed bag. So the Uppsala Prio data, uh, but also the minorities at risk data gets used a lot, and, and there's uh, uh, charts in the paper that go through the different data sets. Um, the, 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 the process of war fighting, where it gets lost out in scholarship, is actually the conduct of war. So we don't have as much information about what happens once violence uh, starts. We have pretty good sense of what how to end it, uh, uh, under what conditions can you possibly get it ended, and perhaps uh, continue it into the future. Where we're really shy is our knowledge and the conduct of war itself. So how does the violence sort of um, um, uh, spread? How do you contain it? What's the best policy for doing that? Um, and then over the 50-year period of the journal when it was established, uh, there's been a shift from um, interstate to, to civil wars, and civil wars as a, as a subject of research unto its own, and it's reflected in the journal. Uh, one of the really striking things, I'm going to make Nils laugh again, because I cannot say these Scandinavian names with such a plum as Henrik, um, but uh, John Galtung wrote the first article on territory and war uh, in 1972, so he founded the journal. So that was a really sweet little nice nugget to open the article that the founder of the journal, the founder of the Peace Research Institute, and basically the founder of conflict studies, um, wrote the first article on territory and war. But it wasn't until seven years after the journal was founded, and it was on the two careers. So if you look at the number of articles on territory and war across the 21 journals, so these are our main journals that we all read. We may not subscribe to them, but we're, we're pulling it out. There was over 200 articles, um, and 36 of them appeared in JPR and 198 of them appeared across the other journals. Um, this is looking, like I said, at the causes, conduct, and resolution, and you can see that the conduct of war, the actual fighting, war fighting, is where we have the least amount of information um, in terms of empirical and theoretical insights. Uh, and then the onset and causes are quite a few. 
This is the number of articles that have addressed territory and interstate war versus civil wars, so intrastate wars. And you can see um, interstate war gets a little bit more pride of place, um, but civil wars um, um, are also um, getting quite a bit of study, which is interesting because if you go back into the 1960s, and I'd say into the 1970s, it didn't, you know, people thought that you couldn't study civil wars as a block, as, as a set of cases that can be compared. It really wasn't until the 1990s that the field of civil, I would say the subfield of civil wars within security studies and IR became um, a, a subject that we felt we could really compare um, across one another. They were one-offs. The first person actually to do it was Robert Bates <coughs> back in the 1970s, but it really didn't take off until the 1990s where people started saying, Maybe these aren't idiosyncratic. Maybe we can learn across the different um, cases. And then, of course, that Roy Licklider article on APSR, I think that's what really supercharged our field, really taking cow. Because if you used cow in the early days, it was all interstate. It wasn't until Roy Licklider published that piece. He's at Rutgers in APSR where he used cow, the Civil War cow data, and showed that actually you could discern patterns. And, Gerald, back to you, genocide. What he showed very disturbingly is, is that it's great to get victories, but then you're more likely to have genocide after. Um, and then the percentage of articles using qualitative and quantitative, here we do see the split, where you see empirical. So one of the things I looked at, what, what was the, the, the contribution of this piece? What did the author say was the contribution? And then after reading the article, what did I feel was the main contribution? And empirics is taking over. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We have great data now. Why not use it? It's not you know we, don't, we can only have so many theoretical insights. Um, but um, uh, the question is is actually whether people think they're making a theoretical contribution when they actually may not be. They may be testing hypotheses that we've all been banding about orders of that. But then of course the question is under what conditions. Um, and so if you're a graduate student in here or you know somebody looking for a new project, I think that the, a place where you could really sort of get some traction is understanding the conduct of war um, and sort of understanding once the war and violence uh, happens, uh, how does it spread, can it be contained? And there's some work being done on that, but there's a lot of places where it can, um, uh, uh, we, we, we can have some more uh, research done. So the key findings, there's a lot of them in the paper. So I'll start with uh, territory itself. John Vasquez, I think, has done some of the most important work on this, looking at the sort of territoriality, his work on war and violence. Um, so most I had interstate territory wars, it's over territory. That is the issue over which uh, combatants are fighting. And it's increased over time, which I was surprised. I actually would have thought it would decrease over time. Um, and then if you look at most civil wars and the Walter um, piece uh, on ethnicity, they sort of underpin this as well, uh, most civil wars involve territory, and if you look at most civil wars today, it's <coughs> over territories, over groups or states and groups, fighting over who's going to control a private place. Um, borders, borders are bad, and so a lot of duking it out within the literature is why and how are they bad, um, and, and the contestation, and it seems that uh, it, what, what two things are really critical is whether there are actually concrete borders drawn, right, do, and, and acknowledged and, and recognized. And then uh, those that don't have international standing at best